Hello and welcome to Wall Street Wire News, where you get today's market in minutes. Hi, I'm Dave Okenquist. Joining me today is a special contributor to Wall Street Wire News, former bond trader, Mr. Rodney Johnson. Rodney, good morning. Morning, Dave. Joining us also is Charles Sizemore, market expert, trader, and editor of the Sizemore Income Letter. Charles, uh, you're in a trophy room today. What's going on, buddy? I am, uh, and these are not participation trophies, I might add. Uh, my, my father-in-law actually earned all these in uh, various horse shows. It is kind of funny. I'm in somebody else's trophy room, but uh, that's okay. Yeah, excellent. Great. Great, great to a little change of scenery. And uh, are you coming from, is it Peru, you said? Yes, uh, broadcasting live from Paihan, Peru, that uh, sprawling metropolis that uh, ranks right up there with Paris and London. And uh, no. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a little farm town on the Peruvian coast. Beautiful. All right, I want to get to a story from WallStreetWireNews.com. The new age of day trading apps has day trade is asking if day traders are driving the markets and how this thing will end. Uh, I noticed there's from many traditional analysts are kind of not happy about this is the tone of, of this reporting that people are getting investment advice from TikTok people and stuff like that. But uh, and it seems like, man, uh, these day traders are kind of pumping up stocks, dumping them. Uh, and uh, is this uh, I'll shoot first to you, Rodney, is, is could this be a Robin Hood day trader pushing up the market? Well, I don't I don't think that Robin Hood day traders are driving the market per se. I think they're riding the market. Very different. I think the Federal Reserve deserves all the credit or blame, however you want to look at it, for pumping $120 billion a month into the economy, which has to eventually go somewhere. And it rolls downhill into uh, high risk equities eventually. Um, and I think that People are signing on to Robinhood, they're buying options, and they're getting paid, meaning that it's working out. And so it's driving them to do more of it. And so it doesn't mean that they're the ones who are the underlying cause, but they're certainly enjoying the effect. And I think old line investors, and I, I count myself as one having been in this game for 30 plus years, uh, look at it and just think, this doesn't make a lot of sense. But then again, the market's manipulated, and these people have found a way to take advantage of it. Uh, Charles, there's a quote here from uh, uh, Keith Temperton, a sales trader at Fort Security, said this has not ended well historically, uh, referring to this kind of speculation here with the uh, undisciplined investors. Uh, do, they do not like these Robin Hood people. What do you what do you make of all this or, or are you more on Rodney's side? You know, I, I, I started investing in the late 90s. I was not doing it professionally at the time. I was actually just getting out of college. But it just looks and feels like it. You remember the, the late 90s was when all of the discounted online brokers first hit the scene, right? Like, you know, a lot of these are not even around anymore, but um, what eventually morphed into TD Ameritrade, what eventually morphed into uh, Schwab, yeah, well, Schwab had been around before, but in its current format, all of that started in the late 90s. You know, before that, stock commissions were wildly expensive. It just wasn't practical for small investors to, to actively trade. All of that became possible in the late 90s. And then with it, you had internet chat rooms and message boards and all the things that we used to play with before we had social media and all that stuff, right? So uh, it, it really does look like this is late 90s 2.0. It's the same deal. You have even greater democratization of trading. You went from having you know $10 and $15 trades to free trades, uh, and you, even with fractional shares. Uh, and then you combine that with you have this information overload of you know people chattering on social media or whatnot. It's just it's the same deal. So it didn't end well in, in the '90s, of course. <laughs> I mean, it blew up in spectacular fashion, but it doesn't mean that a lot of people didn't make a lot of really good money before it did. You know, if you're if you're playing this game, go for it. Just make sure you do have an exit strategy. I mean, nothing wrong. There is nothing wrong with participating in a wildly speculative bubble. Yeah. Just make sure that you don't drink the Kool-Aid, become a true believer and commit mass suicide in you know, <laughs> South America or something. Just, just, just make sure <laughs> you know when to get out. It's that old saw of never confuse good luck with brains. Yeah. And Re uh, yeah, recognize it as good luck and, and, and take advantage of it, but don't get cocky. We, we happen to be living in a time where the Federal Reserve is doing everything it can to maintain and grow uh, equity markets for very – none of this is conspiratorial. I mean, we don't, we don't have to look far. They're telling us, look, we don't want the markets to take a substantial hit because it affects people's retirement accounts and all sorts of other stuff. And so there's, there's good motivation for what they're doing. Uh, and if we are fortunate enough in this time and age to ride this bubble and to make good money on it, as Charles said, then our job is to do it, to improve our personal position.
But again, we have to recognize that things don't last. And so the Fed took away the punch bowl in 2000 after Y2K and all sorts of technology spending had been pulled forward for that, along with the internet bubble. You have to recognize when things are turning and step away. And so that will be the real question is, did the Robinhood account holders, if we you know look at it that way, the 15 million new account holders who are kind of participating in this, if they're making good money on the way up, will they stand aside on the way down, or are they just going to ride this sucker back down? And that we won't know till it happens. Yeah. Uh, and I, I want to mention the Fed in just a sec, but before there's a hilarious a example, is, uh, speaking of good luck in this in this piece here on WallStreetWireNews.com, take Signal Advance, for example, the over-the-counter traded U.S. health court, healthcare company soared to $70 from $0.70 cents in under a week after it was mistaken for an unlisted texting app called Signal that Tesla co-founder Elon Musk had tweeted about saying, use Signal. Uh, is the is the new strategy going to be to have some uh, unknown company and get a celebrity influencer to tweet the name of your company to get your share price going? <laughs> Anyone take this one? This what is, is it with Elon Musk, Charles? I so this man can break SEC rules all he wants and no one cares, right? The SEC no shows up and says, "Wow, you really can't talk your own book. Wow, you really can't discuss non you know public information." And he does it anyway, and, and he's like, ah, I don't care. And, so and there was there was never any consequence for it. He never really got in trouble, uh, to my knowledge. That's my point. I, did, he pay a, he, did he pay a fine? If he did, it wasn't much of one. Certainly not enough to affect a man worth now $185 billion. Uh, he was not trying to drive up signal stock, no, right? No, it was a total um, So we are not going to see a rush of people who are going to do this pump and dump because it happens to be illegal, which is why it has a name. Yeah. Uh, but it has always been interesting to me that Elon Musk looks like you know, the Teflon Don of uh, CEOs because he can do whatever. So. I suspect it's because they, the government needs him for SpaceX. And if you're paying attention to news a couple of days ago, uh, the, the one, NASA is ver having a hard time launching rockets. Uh, the, one of the most advanced one failed a test. Uh, so I think they're, they're like, hey, this guy can just do whatever he wants because uh, otherwise our space program is kind of in the crap. We went to it. the moon in the 60s and we're having a hard time launching rockets now. You're like, what, what happened? This is a whole different diatribe. We could it is, but probably still. Probably do another show for that, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, you do bring up an interesting point. Perhaps there is a, a little bit of they let some of this slide for for, for Musk because you know they, they might see him as a useful ally for something. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Otherwise, I have no explanation <laughs> for why he gets away with what he does. He's a made man, I think, uh, Ronnie. Despite your efforts to beat on him, <laughs> he's protected. I, God love him, right? I mean, he keeps going along. His company is valued at. $1.9 million for every car that it makes, uh, whereas traditional car companies are valued at a few thousand bucks per car that they make. And so that's not on him. That's on all of us as the investing public. He actually, in a tweet, of course, in a tweet, I mean, everything is done via tweets these days, which, yeah. again, you make me dictator of the world for like a day and like social media just goes away. I, I don't know where it goes, but it goes away. <laughs> But uh, but but anyway, um, he in a tweet he just kind of made an offhand comment, huh? Twitter st or, uh, uh, Tesla stock seems pretty overvalued right now. <laughs> but, and uh, I, mean, I think he said that like two years ago, and then look where it is now. Yep. So uh, there there you go. He's just, you know, just thoughts in the air. You know, he didn't really mean anything by it. He's only the CEO. <laughs> Dream of consciousness from a public CEO about his own stock. Sorry, you guys were talking about the Fed and whether or not they could, uh, you know, if the Fed changes course, then uh, the bottom could potentially fall out. But it doesn't look like that's going to be the case. Uh, new Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen uh, seems to be an advocate of modern monetary theory. And I don't we don't want to get too far in the weeds of this. Uh, but there's a good article by Mark Skousen. and he says, first, it's basic. He says it's the treating the Fed and the Treasury as the same, merging the two together, uh, the primacy of the U.S. dollar when she made her comments against Bitcoin. And third, that there's no practical limit to how much debt the U.S. can issue, uh, and you could just basically roll it into the Fed and let it disappear and no consequences. Guys, are we, are we all modern monetary theorists now? Charles, first. Uh, it, it will work until it doesn't. I, that's, <laughs> I, that, that's basically it. I mean, I, like, I don't want to be that prophet of doom that says this is not going to work because it is. it has been, you know, working, if you want to call it that, and that the Fed has has printed trillions of, you know, proverbially printed, uh, print, uh, proverbially printed 
trillions of dollars and, and it has not uh, generated inflation. It has not caused the dollar to collapse. Hmm. I have a feeling that's one of those things that it will continue to work until it doesn't. Now, you know, we did see in, in Japan, Japan has been experimenting with monetary policy for 30 years. Um, and the yen is a weak currency, but it hasn't collapsed. It hasn't gone the way of, you know, Venezuela or Argentina or Turkey or, you know, just not yet. Like, you know, <laughs> not yet. I give it time. It's only been 30 years, but, uh, <laughs> but no, uh, long story short, they're going to continue to do this because right now they just don't see another option. Um, I think it probably historians will look back on this and say it was all madness. But when you're in the trenches today, they don't really see they have another choice, right? And so I, I think you're going to see this just continue for a while. Um, I think it will eventually destabilize and blow up, but that that may be a decade from now, you know, or, or, or more. So we'll let you know. Rodney, the argument here is that in contrast to quantitative easing, which uh, line in the pockets of, uh, of banks and corporations, this new theory could uh, get money to the people. What do you think of that? Oh, that's a lie. It steals money. <laughs> um, you steal money from people by holding interest rates below inflation. And so your real interest rate, and everybody knows this, if you have money in a savings account, you're earning on average in the United States 0.1% right now. And inflation is running 1.5, 1.6. And so by definition, you're losing 1.5% purchasing power just by having your money sit in the bank. And so that is what the Fed is doing. There, there's no question. They're not hiding this. They've been talking about this since you know Ben Bernanke back in 2009 or 10. And so the goal is to hold interest rates on treasuries well below inflation for the foreseeable future so that the United States cost of paying for its debt, meaning the interest that it pays, doesn't become a burden. And that's where it's practically uh, unlimited, as long as they can do it. And the the... The shackle on that, if it ever comes to pass, will be people wanting to hold the U.S. dollar because the way that modern monetary theory blows up, not changes because it changes back and forth with employment and inflation. It's not worth going into, but that's supposed to be the toggle. Yep. You do deficit spending when unemployment is high. You do less of it when unemployment is low and inflation is high to kind of move back and forth. But the, the catch is that when people who've invested in your stuff, so they use your currency, decide they don't want it anymore, and they leave your currency, that's where things start to fall apart. And to Charles's point, it, it works until it doesn't. That psychological change is not slow. And so when people make the decision to leave a currency, it's a rush for the door that gets very ugly very fast. And so that's what I, we're not in any danger of this because mm -hmm. we don't talk about the other side of this. The United States controls 5,000 nuclear tip weapons, and we are the policemen of the world. We're very integrated into the world economy uh, in terms of trade and other things. So we're not at the point of this being a worry today, yeah. but that is the end game if this ever blows up. And it's hard to stop and hard to fix. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we'd like to report on opportunities for investors. Uh, last week, we mentioned the potential Coinbase IPO. There's another IPO coming out that investors might want to jump on. Uh, this Bumble IPO, the non-traditional dating app. And some of the differences here between uh, popular dating app uh, Tinder is that this one re require it, it, all the initiation comes from the women only. So not so women maybe aren't getting bombarded with requests from men or uh, inappropriate pictures of <laughs> men's privates uh, getting bombarded to women. There's also a, a social component uh, for this, which is a little bit different than Tinder, where it's just, just straight dating. Um, but uh, a question to uh, to you, Rodney, can investors bumble their way into success for this IPO? Eh? Eh? I, I think it's got some value to it. I mean, certainly, uh, you know, we, we're at a point where women initiate conversations, all sorts of other things. And so the idea that you have one where, um, women are required to make the first move to initiate a conversation. Uh, it's a nifty, you know, niche market. Um, if you look at Bumble, uh, they have a higher percentage of their users paying. Mm -hmm. And so clearly it's a sticky, attractive business model. Um, and they also have more women on their site than traditional sites when, yeah. if you look at the percentages men to women. And so from that standpoint, it's pretty attractive. And the woman who started it, I believe her last name is Wolf, uh, she started Tinder. She was one of the people that started Tinder, and she left after a couple of years to start this one. So she saw the need. Uh, the question is always the same: it's valuation. And so I, we don't know where it's going to come out. 
but it, it looks like a viable option and they would use the money instead of just straight cashing out to grow the business, uh, which could be pretty interesting. Um, in general, though, we're looking at this sort of thing right in front of the easing of the pandemic. I don't know if it's going to ease in three months, eight months or 14, but it's going to happen. And so do you want to be in these stocks long term right as people are able to go out and see people in person again? I would think we've got a few months left of running some of these stocks up, but pretty soon the COVID stocks, as they're called, are uh, going to start to take a hit because people are going to see the, the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, Charles, do you think there's a chance of that? Or have we changed fundamentally how uh, people hook up, so to speak, and maybe uh, Bumble could be that next big thing? This is a pretty, like, we're really the wrong three people to be discussing this. <laughs> we're a bunch of old, boring, married men that have <laughs> never used a dating app before. But nope. Uh, nope. Um, I, I would say in, in my, <laughs> just kind of philosophically and from my, my, my few single friends that are still out there, uh, online dating is 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 not new. This is not a product of COVID. And in fact, it should actually increase. I would say if anything, right now, people are going on less dates and less hookups, whatever you want to call it, less interactions with fewer people, just because, you know, if you're, if you're trying to limit your circle of exposure to the virus or whatnot, you're just, you're more likely to be in a, a monogamous relationship, right? Or just, a, yeah. you know, you're, you're not likely to be playing the field. Um, I actually do... <laughs> I was trying to do uh, business with um, a pension executive who was uh, having just a, a personal crisis. He was a bit of a, a player, basically. And uh, he said, I'm, I'm basically a one woman man now, not by choice, but because I was so <laughs> weirded out by the whole COVID thing that I ended up just kind of saying, well, uh, she's OK. I'll just uh, she's just she's my girlfriend now. And um, I, I don't know that I would use one data point as an indication of anything, of course, but uh, I, I would say, you know, does online dating slack off once um, once COVID passes? I would say no. I would say, if anything, you're going to have more people going out, but more people wanting to see more people. I, I think it's the business model is fine. I, I, I agree with Rodney, though. It, it's valuation. A lot of these IPOs that have come out lately, to me, look insane. But uh, IPOs are actually like that, that they're, they're really just kind of lottery ticket crapshoots. So uh, I think it can be a lottery ticket and a crapshoot. That's I'm kind of mixing metaphors there. But um, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those deals. If you, if you think the raging bull market's going to continue, then the IPO boom should continue. Then by all means, have fun with it. But is it a buy and hold? Probably not. Yeah, I mean, something else will take its place. But I, I tend to think in an, in, in an increasingly atomized society, I think things like this, uh, things like Bumble uh, w will continue. And uh, yeah, it remains to be seen, of course, on valuation and all that. But uh, it definitely could be an opportunity for investors. Now, we mentioned Elon Musk in the beginning. And uh, something else, so there's some Tesla news. They're slashing prices in Europe. And Rodney, you, you told me uh, before we began that there's a couple of other uh, maybe more boring companies that have been kind of flying under the radar, car makers. What, what, what have you found? Well, I mean, they're not flying under the radar anymore, right? I mean, you've seen General Motors and Ford both soar this year, uh, two of the best performing stocks in the S&P 500. I think uh, General Motors is the best performing. And they're not doing anything better than they did two or three months ago. What changed, of course, was policy in Washington, where there's this absolutely huge thumb on the scale saying, we are going to move the United States toward renewable energy, toward cleaner emission vehicles, all those things. And so people are looking at Tesla and saying, well, you make a decent car, although it's a little long in the tooth, and it, there is uh, um, a Model S out there that apparently is the prototype for the next model um, that will be coming out body style. But anyway, they can't produce enough cars physically. Mm -hmm. it's just, it is not possible for Tesla to produce enough electric vehicles uh, to satisfy what would be anywhere near a normalizing demand across the United States. And so people are looking at the old line car companies, Ford and General Motors, and of course now Fiat Chrysler, and saying, if it's going to happen, these people have to be involved. And if they're involved, they're going to get a boost. And the boost would be artificial. And, and that comes uh, in a couple of forms. It comes from the federal government uh, putting in higher fuel efficiency standards. And so you can't have as many gasoline vehicles in your fleet because your overall fleet has to uh, come to some sort of average fuel that you can't get to with gasoline and diesel. And so you have to add electric. Uh, it also comes from subsidies. And we can't, I mean, this is the thing. If the federal government 
rips off the limit of 200,000 vehicles produced after that you don't get subsidies or declines for you know a number of vehicles then that's going to be a big advantage to selling electric cars because of course you get a big knock on the price yeah and so as these really big companies get into the game maybe just maybe they'll produce an electric vehicle that somebody wants to buy <laughs> because they haven't done it yet and they've been working on this a long time and so if they do get there then they have a leg up on Tesla just because of sheer size. And so that's what's driving them higher is, is the idea that the government is going to be wildly favoring them at a time where they might actually produce something somebody wants to buy. By the way, Tesla was, uh, I certainly saw it as an aspirational brand. and But uh, I, there's definitely a sheen has come off of that. And even the design, when I see a Tesla that's a couple years old, they look quite ugly to me. Uh, any, any thoughts on that from either of you too? In terms of design? They're okay. Um, I think they're neat, but uh, th th there was a novelty yeah. aspect to it, right? And that novelty isn't really there anymore. Um, I want to say Volvo was the first major automaker to commit to going 100% electric in the near future. I don't remember what their target was. It might have been 2030. It might have even been sooner. But this idea of an all-electric car company, now that you have some of the bigger players jumping in with both feet, yeah. it, there's just not that novel, novelty anymore. Charles, now, given everything uh, Rodney said about the, about the change in government and policy and all that, uh, if, you look, if you're an investor, you're looking at GM, Ford, Toyota, and you mentioned some of the European makers. I mean, can you lose here? It seems like the, the wind is, they have a lot of wind at their back uh, for these stocks should, right? Can you lose money in an auto stock? <laughs> um, I, I believe the answer to that question would have to be yes, given the history of that industry. Well, we're going to have government money pouring in here. I mean, they see, at least, uh, I mean, not okay, so not can you lose, but uh, at least they- Remember, see General Motors is a company that had the slate wiped clean uh, about a decade ago and yet still manages to just spin its wheels, uh, no pun intended, um, and can't seem to get out of its own way. So, so I, even with all this behind it, you'd still be careful then? I would. I, don't get me wrong. I mean, this, this stock has great momentum right now, by all, and it's not wildly expensive. Well, by the standards of an expensive market, it's not particularly expensive w within that context. So by all means, have fun with it. But this is not a sure thing by any stretch of the imagination. It's, so an interesting point here, and it's something I've written about uh, several times. Uh, Tesla has never made a nickel selling electric cars. They lose money on every car they make. Tesla makes money by selling zero emission auto credits to other manufacturers who don't make zero emission cars that people want to buy. And so they sell them to Ford and General Motors and other people. And so if General Motors and Ford and these other manufacturers ramp up their own electric vehicle production, which is what they are spending billions of dollars doing. So that, that clearly is where they're headed. Uh, then the big loser here is going to be Tesla. Not only are they going to lose market share, arguably, because these other people are taking, if not their existing market share, but some of their prospective market share, they're going to lose these hundreds of millions of dollars that they receive every quarter in emission credits that they sell because other people don't need them. The value of the credits will go down or to zero. And so that's that's going to be very interesting to watch. Yeah, absolutely. Well, at least uh, <laughs> at least Elon Musk has SpaceX. <laughs> well, and, and I mean, even if he lost a uh, hundred and eighty four billion dollars, he would still be a billionaire. So yeah. there's that. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, he's the richest man in the world right now, isn't he? It's, it's, uh, last uh, Close. I think Bezos passed him again because uh, Amazon had a <laughs> They're neck and neck. It's a horse race. Yeah. Yeah. It's a horse race. Yeah, speaking of. <laughs> uh, spe speaking of horses, yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right, I want to thank you all for watching. Uh, I want you to, uh, if you're watching this uh, either on YouTube or on Facebook, I want you to head on over to Wall Street Wire News and sign up for our free email newsletter where you can get today's market in minutes. Uh, Charles, uh, before you get out of here, any, any thoughts on the, on the week ahead and uh, how can everybody find your work? Well, to find my work, just uh, sizemorecapital.com is fine. Uh, as for the week ahead, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's uh, what, what, what's really going on right now? Everyone kind of has all their eyes on, uh, you know, the new Biden administration, what new regulations are coming out of it and whatnot. And already there, there's been quite a few that have, that have ruffled some feathers, um, restrictions on drilling and whatnot. So it'll be in interesting to see how that plays out.
Absolutely. And uh, we will be, we will not be here next week. I will be away, but we'll be back the following week. Uh, Rodney, in be, while everyone's waiting for the next video, what, what can they uh, expect in the markets? Well, I think the markets are, are going to be digesting a lot of this news. And as Charles said, I mean, it's going to be a rotation as people try to figure out who's going to win and who's going to lose, given the new regulations coming through. And energy is going to be a big one. Uh, there are winners and losers within that sector, right? If you're a, an E&O production company, you're, you're out there, you know, searching for oil and gas and pulling it out of the ground, you probably have a tough road ahead. Uh, but if you're a pipeline company, chances are things are good. I mean, you don't want to be TransCanada, but the other ones just became more valuable because guess what? They're not going to approve any new ones. So there's, there's opportunity that people will be finding for sure. Great. For Charles Sizemore and Rodney Johnson, I'm Dave Oakenquist and have a great trading day.